Well, I'm not even going to pretend that I'm going to say anything new to you this morning that you haven't already known and haven't already heard this week. But uh, I do want to say it in my own way, and I and hope and pray that you will be edified despite my humanity and my inadequacy. You know, uh, Brother Given said that the, the New Covenant was about eternal life and about blessing, and I'm not going to contradict that. But you can also say the New Covenant is about love. The New Covenant is uh, all about God's grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, things that have been said this week are not contradictory of one another, but the, the Gospel is like a, a precious gem, a jewel that has many facets, many angles to look at it. And you can look at it from all these different angles and see different things, different light colors reflected in it, but it's all the same gem, all the same jewel. And so this morning, I would like to tell you that the Gospel, the New Covenant, is all about glory. And really, this is what we're gathered here for, is, is about glory. We're here to glorify God because He is glorious. We're here to speak of the glorious honor of His majesty and of His wondrous works, to speak of the might of His terrible acts, declare His greatness, abundantly utter the memory of His goodness, and sing of His righteousness. For the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Now that was said under the old covenant. And if that could be said by the psalmist, way back then, what could be said today? What power, what mighty acts have we seen? If David could say that, now what goodness and righteousness has been bestowed upon us? And what glory have we seen? We have gathered together this week to get into the specifics of what that psalmist wrote there. Now those were just generalizations. We want to talk about specifics and the ones that apply to us. <clears throat> now the covenant is a covenant of greater glory. That's the title of my message. A covenant of greater glory. I would like to, uh, at the start here, just establish some uh, a foundational basis for glory. First of all, glory comes from God. All glory. All glory comes from God. There is no other source of glory. Power and glory belong to God. All things were created and exist to glorify God. And that is ultimately the end of all things. Ultimately, all things will have done what God intended them to do. It is written, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. There is none other. If all of eternity could be added up in one statement, I don't know if that would be possible, but if eternity, past, present, and future, if you could sum it all up and just put it in one statement, I think it would be this, that God is glorified above all as God. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. David said, glory and honor are in his presence, strength and gladness are in His place. Well, that's simply because He is there. That's why it's in His place. You recall that after the creation, God looked and saw everything, that it was very good. Well, that's because He created it. That's why. 
It was His Holy Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters. His Son, the Word, was there in the beginning with Him. Now that was the one by whom and for whom all things were made. And man, the highest creation on earth, was made in their image. It was God that set the tree of life in the garden, and it was God that set the serpent in the garden. It was God that drove man out of the garden. God placed the angel with the flaming sword to protect the garden, to protect the tree of life. God destroyed the earth with a flood, and God put his bow, which incidentally is another covenant, in the cloud. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was God that called Abraham and God that made the promise to him. God gave Isaac. And it might interest a lot of theologians to know that God chose Jacob over Esau, despite what you may think of Jacob. God chose Jacob. God planted Joseph in, Joseph in Egypt, not his brothers. And 430 years later after the promise, God delivered his people, Israel, out of Egypt. Moses was God's man. The law was given him by God. God provided for the people in the wilderness. God parted the Jordan. God caused the walls of Jericho to fall. God drove out the Canaanite. The prophets received their message from God, and it was promises about God that they spoke of. Promises of better things to come from Him. Promises of a new covenant, of a better hope, of a greater glory. Because this God would dwell with them among them. God was promising to show them His glory as they had never seen Him before. And in all these things, and in all this in the old time, God was glorified. And in the new covenant, the Lord is still receiving glory upon glory. It was God's Son that was sent, and God sent Him. Over and over again, about 30 times in the book of John alone, Jesus emphasizes My Father. He says, Things like, my Father worketh hitherto. As my Father hath taught me, I speak. My Father is greater than I. I go unto my Father. <clears throat> my Father is the husbandman. My Father hath sent me. And many more such statements. And it was His Father that bruised Him. God laid upon Him all of our iniquities. And it was God that was pleased to do so. Jesus Christ was sacrificed to satisfy God, not man. It was God that put him to death, and it was God that raised him again by his own glory. And afterward, he ascended to the right hand of the majesty on high, that is God's right hand, and God has made him a prince and a savior. God has glorified him with his own glory, and why? In order that your faith and hope might be in God. <clears throat> I can tell you why repentance glorifies God. It is because it is God that for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I can tell you why justification glorifies God. It is because it is God that justifieth. By faith we have been made the righteousness of God in Him. That is Jesus Christ, God's Son. And that same faith is the faith of Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ, His Son. So what I'm establishing here is that all the credit, all the honor, all the homage, all the glory goes to God. He is the source of all glory. Just as surely as we know that all things work together for the good of them that are the called according to His purpose, to them that love Him, in the same way all things are working together for God's glory. Amen. The Son glorifies Him, the Holy Spirit glorifies Him, and the whole earth is full of His glory. Amen. Now if you can see it, even Satan and his band only serve His purpose. Ultimately, yes. though ignorantly, ultimately they're glorifying God because they're doing exactly as He knew they would. <clears throat> a perceptive son knows the things that touch his father's heart. And I think that Jesus touched perhaps the most sensitive part of God's heart, if I may speak that way, when he prayed this prayer, Father, glorify thy name. Amen. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Amen. And that is what God is doing. 
His name was glorified before the foundation of the world, and it will be glorified when the world passes away. He was glorified under the old covenant, and he will be glorified under the new. He is glorified in heaven, and he will be glorified in earth. He is glorified in his son, and he will be glorified in many sons. Amen. He is glorified now, and he will be glorified then. God must be glorified. It is inevitable that God will be glorified Amen. because he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath, and there is none other. <clears throat> By his omnipotent power, he created the cosmos. By his omniscient wisdom, he knew the beginning and the end, even from before the beginning. And what he is doing in this brief moment in history is displaying his manifold wisdom to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. He is glorifying himself by bringing many sons to glory, and that solely by the might of his own right arm. <clears throat> God will be glorified. I want to interject here that this is not an endorsement of Calvinism. Yes, I am certainly speaking of God's sovereignty, of his omniscience, of his omnipotence, but the gospel is how he uses that sovereignty. There's a way that God uses his power and his wisdom. <clears throat> now we are made in his image. David marveled at this, and he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now surely you've taken time in your life to examine yourself and no doubt you've noticed that you have a desire to have what we call purpose in life. We feel the need for what we call personal fulfillment. Man has a penchant for some kind of attention, some kind of honor, some kind of credit in this life, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and God has intentionally made us with a desire for glory. We were made in His image. Now, not only has He made us with this desire for glory, but He has made us the vessels of His glory. God has equipped us with marvelous abilities above all His other creatures. Upon examining my own life, I find that I have so many abilities, so many things that I want to do that I, I just can't do them all. Every day things pass us by that we... Perhaps we hardly pay attention to them anymore, but things pass us by, we say, I, I could do that, or what if I were to pursue that and, and accomplish this goal or that, but these things have to be left by the wayside so that we can pursue the weightier, necessary things. What could you do if you're only younger? Or if you're only a little wealthier? If only you had more time, more strength, if only the right people would let you get your foot in the door. What could you have been if in your teenage years you knew what you know now? What could you have been perhaps if you had taken the apostles' advice and remain unmarried? This brief pilgrimage does not allow us the luxury of complete fulfillment. There's so much that we must sacrifice in order to secure the eternal things. Perhaps there are even outstanding abilities that you had once in your youth that, that you gave them up so long ago, possibly you just forgot that you ever even had them. Such is the journey of our pilgrimage. But the gospel is the good news that calls us to abandon the temporal in order to obtain the eternal glory, and it gives us the power to do it. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. <clears throat> to state it another way, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. 
Now it's been noted before that we often sing songs that are not sound in thought. <clears throat> and there's one that I, uh, I think of often that I like the course a lot. It's a very good course. It says, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. It's taken right out of the scriptures. Unfortunately, the verses that go with that uh, are not quite as good. One of the verses says, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why, unworthy, Christ in love redeemed me for his own. And there are four more verses which the writer shares with us the many things that he does not know, or at least did not know at the time. <clears throat> and that's not the only song like that. There's another one that says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad, so glad he did. Well, I'm glad he did too. But I also know why he did, and that's what makes me so glad. It's the why. It's no mystery why God has been gracious, or why Christ died for us. It's no mystery why God has gone to the greatest extent of his love and mercy to save us. The scriptures plainly proclaim the answer. Hebrews 12, 2 says it was for the joy of that was set before him. That joy that Christ endured temptation and contradiction for. That joy that he sacrificed his life for. That joy that he prayed fervently for is the glory of the new covenant. Amen. What was it that he said after Judas left to betray him? He said, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also straightway glorify him. God shall also glorify him in himself and straightway glorify him. And in John 17, 1, he prayed, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. And in verse 5 of the same chapter, he says, And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Brethren, we, not, we ought not to be ashamed to stand and say that by our patient continuance and well-doing, we seek after glory and honor and immortality. Amen. That's why our Savior did it, and that's why we're doing it. Amen. We're not ashamed to admit that we're in this race for the glory. Amen. Now, I am careful to say that that is not the only reason that we're in the race. But that is the goal. We are running to obtain a prize an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away in heaven. Now, this is something of my own observation. I don't know that you'll ever find it in any textbook. But I've found that the gospel appeals to two parts of the inner man. <clears throat> I've seen this in myself. The two parts, <clears throat> the first one is our sense of gratitude or our sense of obligation. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that the love of Christ constraineth us. It constrains us to do what we do. To live like, like we live and to die the way that we die. And to the Ephesians, he wrote of his desire that they might come to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And doesn't the knowledge of our Savior's great love for us produce that in our hearts? The preaching of Christ's sufferings and great sacrifice will bring this out in a person. How can we see his sufferings for our sins and not be drawn to him? How can we survey the glory that he left behind in order to come here and save us and not listen to his words? We carefully examine his great love for us as he wept and prayed and sweat as it were great drops of blood in the garden. And as he freely laid down his life for us in the cross, and we, we resolve that we must embrace this Jesus. Amen. Several times in the apostolic writings, we read where people responded to the preaching of the gospel with a simple question, what must I do to be saved? As if to say, what, whatever it requires, I'll do it. Anything, how can I honor him? I don't want to be guilty of rejecting this great salvation. Amen. What does my loving, merciful, and gracious God require of his unworthy servant. I will ask and I will do it because I see that I can trust him. 
I can see that His yoke is easy and His burden light. I see that He bore all of the punishment that I deserved. And I will come to Him in faith. Trusting that mercy, love, and grace which I now so plainly see. And well, we should have that kind of response. The Gospel does necessitate a humble response. It will produce a sense of great obligation and undying gratitude in the hearts of the believers. There is no one more lovable than the one who loved us. And there is no one worth giving your life to but the one who already gave his life for us. Devotion, obligation, and gratitude is certainly a great part of Christianity. And I fear that we've been stuck there sometimes. This devotion, gratitude is, is found at the cross. As I've, I've said, it's, when we look upon Jesus, it produces that first part. It, it appeals to that first part of the inner man. But see, there's more to the gospel than that. There's still an empty tomb to visit. I think we all probably see that devotion is lacking in the churches in general. I'm not saying the teaching of devotion is lacking. There's plenty of that. It's devoted people that we are lacking. You can't make people love God by telling them that they ought to love God. You can't get people excited about going to heaven by telling them that they ought to be excited about going to heaven. Only the gospel has that power, and that's God's divinely chosen way. It will produce devotion, but it also satisfies the second part of the inner man that I have found. As we grow up into Christ and are being changed into His image, we grow in our love for Him. But sooner or later, <clears throat> this question will come to our mind, and Brother Wallace mentioned it last night. God, what have you done lately for my faith? Or, what's in it for me? And that answer is found as we look into the empty tomb. Now, unfortunately, the resurrection is not spoken about much, but that's because when people look in it, they don't see anything. Of course, you're not supposed to see anything. There's nothing in there, and that's the point. What is seen in the empty tomb is seen by faith. And what do we see but Jesus, crowned with glory and honor? Now, we ask, what's in it for me? Not because we are tired of loving our Savior, it's not that I found him a hard master. It's not that I feel that I've merited anything from him. But I do know that service without pay is nothing but slavery, and I've just been delivered from the bondage in Egypt. I've heard that we are God's sons and daughters, and I hear that he is just and merciful. The gospel tells us that there is something in it for us, and that something is glory. The glory of the new covenant, and that is what we proclaim here today. Verily I say unto you that there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, and in the world to come. Now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Amen. Now that's just for starters. That was just a, a generalization. There's much more in the specifics that we have to speak of, and that brings me to my text. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. I'll start at verse 6. So this is one of the very few passages I found that I, I like in the New International Version. I don't say, I'm not saying it's a sin if you use the New International Version. I'm not going to condemn anyone for that. I'm just saying I don't like it. But, but I'm going to read my text from it. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 6. <clears throat> he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? 
Now he says the same thing again in a different way. <clears throat> if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Amen. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater the glory of that which lasts. <clears throat> Now, there are several things that I want to draw from this text, and ultimately we're going to compare the glory of the Old Covenant to the glory of the New Covenant. <clears throat> Verse 6 says that He has made us competent as ministers. Other translations state that sufficient as ministers, adequate as, mi as servants, able ministers, and competent to be ministers of the New Covenant. Now, we gather from this that there's something that's required of us able to do something, competent to minister something. There's something that's required of us, both in the Old and the New Covenant. <clears throat> but when we speak of God's covenants, as Brother Harold pointed out, we do well, we do not do well to compare them to what is commonly thought of as a covenant today. <clears throat> because in, in covenants and contracts today, there's negotiation. Two parties come together upon at a, upon agreed upon time, at agreed upon place, and sometimes to discuss things that are disagreed upon. Party one says, we are willing to do thus and so, but party two, you must comply with this. And party two says, we can't comply with that demand unless you first give us provisions to do this concerning such and so. Party then, one replies, we agree, we agree to give you 50% of those provisions that you request if you agree to comply with our demands, which we set forth earlier, plus an additional demand. Upon which, party two says, we will agree to that if you give us an additional 30 days to comply with all of your demands. The so two parties then agree, shake hands, sign the papers, and you have a covenant. But not so with the covenants of God. <clears throat> there is no negotiation. For two reasons. Firstly, because we are not in the position to be negotiated. <clears throat> and secondly, because we wouldn't even have thought of making a covenant. <clears throat> in the covenants, God is on the initiative. God is making the promises and God is doing the fulfilling. <clears throat> and yet there is a demand of us both in the new and the old covenants. The demand may be looked upon from many different angles and you can express it many different ways. But for my purposes, in this message, I believe that that demand is just this one thing. You can condense it down to one thing, that is to glorify God, in whose image you were made. Now you can expand upon that and say, have no other gods before me. You can expand it upon it and, and say, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But I believe the end result really is the same, and that is to glorify God. Now, for man's part, our part in this covenant, <clears throat> actually, in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, our part's really the same thing. It hasn't changed any. And yet, the covenants are different. The difference between the covenants is on God's part. The distinction between the two covenants is made by what God has done, not by what's required of us or what we have done. It's by what God has done because we couldn't do anything. You know, the law presented us with some instructions to follow and a goal if we followed those instructions. And that was, this do and thou shalt live. So there was, there was a goal for us to reach, something for us to accomplish under the old covenant. And it was real simple. It was basic common it was simply live live if you can god even showed us how to live and we couldn't do it he been he was saying you've been created in my image i've chosen you for my people i've given you my law my instruction now live and we couldn't do it the old covenant was a ministry that brought death because we were not able ministers of it it showed us to be insufficient, incompetent, unable, and inadequate. In a word, dead. 
The old covenant demanded dead men to live, and even that by our own power. <clears throat> now surely you can see that this covenant was glorious. That is what our text says. It says the ministry that condemns men is glorious. Actually, it says, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious. Now, that if that Paul uses there is not a hypothetical if, like, what if the ministry that condemns men is glorious. It's, it's a comparing if. He's comparing truth with truth to establish truth. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, then how much greater is the, glorious, the ministry that brings righteousness? <clears throat> The Old Covenant, then, was glorious, as our text says. Wasn't God on the initiative in the Old Covenant? Yes, He certainly was. Wasn't God making promises? Certainly. And wasn't He fulfilling the promises, fulfilling what He said He would do? Yes, He certainly did. Didn't He give us His law? Yes. And wasn't it just and holy and good? Yes, it certainly was. And wasn't God merciful and just? And wasn't he the great Jehovah to his people? He gave us the word of his mouth, gave us the word by his own mouth, and he wrote it on tablets of stone himself. His glory abode on Mount Sinai in the form of a cloud. His glory was on top of the mountain like a devouring fire. There was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud and the voice of a trumpet. That was all his. Certainly there was glory under the old covenant. It was His glory that caused Moses' face to shine and that caused the people to fear. Now our text is obviously referring to the giving of the law and the glory which accompanied that event. But that certainly is not the only place and the only time that there was glory under that old dispensation, if I may use that term. There was much glory under the old dispensation. It appeared to Moses in a bush that burned with fire and yet was not consumed. It was in the ten plagues that were visited upon Egypt. His glory was made manifest in the mighty works that he performed for Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground, the pillar of fire and the cloud. He even passed by Moses as he covered him there in the cliff of the rock and let him see the glory of just his back parts. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And he gave his people Israel manna and meat and water from a rock. He made their shoes last for 40 years. He defeated their enemies for them and drove them out. He sent them the legendary heroes of deliverance like Gideon and Samson and Deborah and Esther and Joshua and David. Prophets like Elijah who prayed once and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, many of which did many great miracles and wonders by the hand of God. There were angelic appearances and intervention. And time doesn't permit me to list all of the ways that God used His glorious majesty under that old dispensation. And yet with all of that glory that was under the old dispensation, the entire generation of the Israelites that were delivered from Egypt died in the wilderness, except for two. And to this very hour of this very day, some of those promises are not fulfilled because they failed to do as God commanded. Time and time again, they turned to false gods. They rejected and stoned God's prophets. <clears throat> the great city Jerusalem was sacked. The temple destroyed. The people scattered to the four corners of the earth. They even crucified the Lord of glory. After all of the glory that had been displayed under the Old Covenant, the people were still insufficient, still inadequate, still unable. There was indeed glory under that Old Dispensation, but it didn't do anything for the persons. The dead man was still dead. As a matter of fact, he was so dead he didn't even know he was dead. That's what the law was for, to show us. When a man looked at the Old Covenant and asked that question, what's in it for me? The answer can be nothing but death. And therein is God glorified because it served exactly the purpose that He intended it to serve. Amen. 
By the law was proven both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. It didn't do much in the glory, didn't do much in the way of glory for the persons, but it glorified God. But now the new covenant is a covenant of greater glory. New because it's different in nature, not just in content. And it's a greater glory because it surpasses the glory of the former, making it as though it had none by comparison, as our text says. And by greater glory, we do not mean more of the same glory. That's important. <clears throat> Some of the glorious things that occurred before Christ occurred after Christ and even occur today. In the New Testament scriptures, upon occasion, the voice of God was audibly heard from heaven. There were still angelic appearances, miraculous signs and wonders, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And that was just by one man, Jesus Christ. But this was no different from the glory that was under the old covenant. The miracles that were under the old covenant that were wrought, the miracles that were wrought by Christ and the apostles, and even those miracles that God chooses to work today are not the glory of the new covenant. Amen. Israel had that under the old covenant. That's nothing new. In fact, according to our text, that kind of glory has no glory now in comparison to the greater glory. Amen. Behold, I make all things new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. <clears throat> the glory of the new covenant is a covenant <clears throat> is a greater glory because it is a magnanimous glory, if you will. That is to say that because of Jesus Christ, we have been made partakers of God's glory. In the new covenant, God is on initiative again. He's making promises again and he's fulfilling his word again. But in the new covenant, he's brought the dead to life. He has, as it were, made dry bones to live. In the new covenant, God is the same, and the demand for us is the same, but we are changed. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he also called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified now when we ask what's in it for me the answer is glory he has called you by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our lord jesus christ all that god has done and is doing is for glory i want to establish that all that god has done and is doing is the means to an end <clears throat> the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That was the, the means of the law, was to bring us to Christ. Israel was chosen, and they rejected Christ, that the Gentiles might be grafted in. Jesus left his glory and humbled himself and became a servant, that he might bring many sons to glory. He shed his own blood to wash our sins away in order to prepare us for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying is that everything that God has done is the means to an end. And the end of the gospel is glory. Glory for you, glory for me, glory for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is a covenant of greater glory because we are no longer far off observers, we are partakers in it. We are participants. What wonderful blessings have been bestowed upon us in the new covenant. <clears throat> Now, there is a secret to knowing this glory. It's a secret that I'm afraid the church in general hasn't learned yet. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency and the power may be of God and not us. So if you want to know how God has glorified us, look at Christ. The glory that God has given him, 
He has given to us. Whatever you can say about Christ, you can say about us. <clears throat> that we may be one, even as they are one, as Jesus prayed. He is God's Son, and we have been made God's sons. The same Holy Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters at the creation is the same Holy Spirit that lives in us, revealing God's holy word to us, empowering us to resist temptation, just like Jesus did, and giving us the knowledge to pray for the right things and have our speech seasoned with salt, just like Jesus was. Jesus Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ is righteous, and we have been made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. <clears throat> in fact, the new covenant is referred to as the ministration of righteousness, as our text says. So being made free from sin opens up the way for a whole lot of glory. And in the gospel, that's exactly what God has planned for us. Amen. Righteous means free from sin, free from guilt. Righteous means God is free to bless us. We're free to go to heaven. Eternal life is now free. Righteousness means that God can identify us with Himself and have fellowship with us. God has made His abode in us because we have been made righteous. Now here's another mystery to the world that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And even this is in order to display God's wondrous power. Amen. We have new hearts, new minds, new affections, a pure conscience, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but outwardly, our man is still the same. We have it in the same vessel. <clears throat> We've been made new creatures in Christ. The inner man is new, but we have it in the same old vessel. The carnal nature is still alive and well and must be buffeted and overcome in order to accomplish anything good. In this earthen vessel, we have both corruption and glory. Even the vessel itself is corrupt. And what we must do is cope with this. This is what is known as the good fight of faith. It's known as working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's known as crucifying the flesh and taking up your cross. Now, however difficult the way may seem to us at times, we don't shrink away from this because God has empowered us to live and to die. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We are also partaking we are also partakers of his sufferings but we glory in them because they are also the means to an end. The cross is the means to an end and that end is glory. For as you are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Now we are partakers of His grace, now partakers of His holiness, partakers of the Spirit and of the divine nature. We are even partakers of Christ. But that's not the consolation that the Apostle is speaking about in this passage. <clears throat> Peter tells us in his epistle, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. Now I am glad that Christ has been glorified. I am very glad that Christ is receiving glory. I want him to receive glory. And I know that he is worthy of all the glory that the Father can possibly give him. Amen. But if we are God's children, then we are also heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Amen. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. This is the end to which God has redeemed us. <clears throat> that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy which He had afore prepared unto glory to be his sons is to be like his only begotten son to be an heir is to be like his heir if you want to know what God has prepared for you then look at Jesus Christ Amen. by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God 
Now it's good that we are mindful and grateful that Christ suffered and died and was buried and rose again. And well, we should remember that we are forgiven of sins and become members of the church, Christ's body. But let's not get stuck just in what's going on now. And let's not forget that the new covenant is not completely fulfilled yet. The greater part actually is yet to come. What we know in the present time is a means to an end, and that end is glory. This mystery, this hidden wisdom, is what God has ordained before the world unto our glory. We charge each other, therefore, that ye should walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. And if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. As Spurgeon said, happy, happy, happy wounds which drive me to my Savior's bosom. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, it perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. For when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. But if before the Lord returns, this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Fear not the black wings of death. For if we have been partakers of him in life and death, then we will also be partakers with him in the resurrection. This body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We have been raised to walk in newness of life here and now. There is glory here and now, but it's only by faith. Peter wrote that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And he also said that by Jesus Christ we believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your hope might be in God. Now what we are being kept by faith unto and the reason, for Christ, the reason that Christ's glory strengthens our faith in God is because what we see by faith is what we get. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's what the gospel is all about. It's about glory. That wonderful salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time is nothing but glory, glory, glory. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, said that he prayed for them, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, wisdom about what? What was it that Paul wanted them to know? What knowledge about Jesus Christ is so important? Well, let's read on. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under him under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Now does it seem to you that the apostles shifted thoughts there all of a sudden? One minute he's magnifying Christ, saying how that Christ has been glorified God and everything's been put under him, all power and glory has been given him, and all of a sudden we're talking about the church, <clears throat> which is his body, which is his fullness. You see, the covenant is not completely fulfilled yet. Christ's glory has not been fulfilled yet because we're not there yet. We are his fullness. 
We are his glory. One of the hymn writers wrote, We would see Jesus. This is all we're needing. Strength, joy, and willingness come with the sight. Why did Paul make so much of preaching none but Christ? Why do the sacred writings tell us so much of Christ's glory? Why does the sight of him glorified bring strength and willingness? Because God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has determined that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. That is, that Christ will be glorified in his body, the church. And ye in him, that is, <clears throat> that you are raised up and glorified because of what Christ has done. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now isn't that what Jesus said in his prayer in John 17? And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Amen. That they may be one, even as we are one. In the new covenant, God has extended his glory, not only on us, but in us, through Jesus Christ. He has made us kings, priests, and sons. And now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, if I had to sum up the glory of the new covenant and narrow it down to one definition and one statement, that would be it for me. We shall be like him. Christ has been glorified by the Father. Because he glorified the Father by taking our sins away, thereby bringing many sons to glory. And we glorify the Father by believing on Jesus Christ, whom God hath sent. Amen. And because we have received the atonement and have believed on Jesus Christ, God shall also glorify us, his many sons, with his only begotten Son. Now, brethren, the old covenant the law didn't even come close to offering anything like that. Amen. Comparing the glory of the old covenant to the glory of the new is like comparing the light of a candle to the light of the sun. That candle may serve a purpose in a darkened room, but it cannot illumine the whole earth and cause the nature to spring up and grow like the sun can. Amen. The candle serves only to show you that there's got to be something better. There's got to be something brighter. God hath both glorified His name and will glorify it again. Amen. Only God could do this. Only God could transform dead sinners into living sons and daughters of God. So I ask you again to consider it in thine heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath and there is none else. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. And to the Lamb we sing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. And to you, my brethren in Christ, I say this, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen.